environment and ecology that is approximately 50 marks in prelims examination and cut off is mostly around 100 marks so environment and ecology is important last four chapters of class 12 biology can make your concepts clear and you can find most of the questions coming out from this source and not only that concept that you will learn you can apply those concept in the rest of the questions to solve multiple choice questions this series can help you in elimination of those options anyone who wants to learn basic environment and ecology can watch this video series even if you are neat aspirant upsc aspirant or class 12 student or giving any competitive exams such as cds capf or any state services this series is for you here we will revise organisms and population in detail with the help of notes in under 30 minutes and similarly we can cover the next three chapters as well so without a further ado let us begin unity in diversity represents our country india is colorful we have deserts mountain glaciers hill stations rivers forest beaches and islands we have diversity in species too very environment around you is diverse in this chapter we will learn how different organisms adapt and adjust with first other organisms and second environment itself and their ultimate goal is often survival at any level of biological environment we can ask two types of questions that is how and why now you guys know bulbul she is able to produce beautiful melodies now i have two questions how a bulbul sings and secondly why a bulbul sings early in the morning the answer will be vocal cord in the first question and in the second one to communicate so bulbul sings with the help of vocal cord to communicate the point is how type questions seek mechanism while why type questions seeks purpose now how sociology teaches us interaction of various communities similar to that ecology is a subject which studies the interaction among organisms and between the organism and its physical environment that is abiotic environment ecology is basically concerned with four levels of biological organizations first organisms second populations third communities and lastly biomes in this chapter we explore ecology at organismic and population level that is first two now organism and its environment ecology at the organismic level that is the first level itself is essentially physiological ecology which tries to understand how different organisms are adapted to their environments in terms of not only survival but also reproduction let us imagine a class where every kind of student is present padaku multi talented sports person but everyone has to pass in order to get promoted to next standard irrespective of their iq background and interest everyone has to survive similarly every organism has to survive irrespective of variation this variation can be variation in temperature rainfall humidity salinity etc now why is there variation in our planet at the first place the rotation of our planet around the sun and the tilt of its axis causes annual variations in the temperature resulting in distinct seasons due to differences in rainfall temperature and other factors it is not like that only moderate climate of goa is suitable for life life exists in the hot climate of rajasthan too it also exists in the rain soaked meghalaya forest and also in the deep ocean trenches let us take the example of our indian soldiers our respected soldiers serve the nation in minus 16 degrees without adequate facilities they are also humans and still they are surviving you will be amazed to know that even our intestine is a unique habitat for hundreds of species of microbes over a period of time through natural selection and evolution an organism adapts itself for survival and reproduction example is us our ancestors had tails but they got rid of it because when they moved away from trees to plains to more nomadic lifestyle functional role of tail reduced and eventually we got rid of it similarly giraffe 
Giraffe has evolved long necks because successive generations realized that extra vertebrae help them to get access to tender leaves on top of trees. That is why they have long necks. Some studies also say that the smallest finger or pinky finger will not be there in the future. Why? Because it is contributing less to our workings. Now let us discuss some of the basic terms which will help you in understanding this chapter. Environment Environment means our surroundings. Like we can say about the environment of our room or hostel. Usually we say my working environment is not so cooperative. एक इधर से टांग खींच रहा है तो एक उधर से और इन हॉस्टल समर्स के टाइम बहुत गर्मी होती है एंड ऑन टॉप ऑफ इट आपका रूममेट आपको कुछ उल्टा सीधा पीने को इन्फ्लुएंस करता है सो वी कैन से दैट एनवायरमेंट इज नॉट सो कोऑपरेटिव फॉर स्टडीज सो एनवायरमेंट मीन्स अवर सराउंडिंग्स दैट इंक्लूड्स बोथ बायोटिक एंड ए बायोटिक फैक्टर्स बायोटिक मीन्स ह्यूमन बींग्स एनिमल्स और एनी लिविंग थिंग विच इज सराउंडिंग अस and abiotic means factors such as sunlight soil temperature which are non living things next ecosystem what makes a home a home its members feelings that we exchange food that we share sense of belongingness also material goods such as tv ac fridge etc and daily interaction and all same way ecosystem is sum total of biotic and abiotic components of a particular geographical area it is a functional unit of nature here living organisms interact among themselves and surrounding nature they exchange energies and recycling of nutrients take place in the environment now what is habitat in your city your society is your habitat it is a place where an organism or population of an organism lives and reproduces example for polar bears arctic sea and surrounding glaciers are their habitat and many habitat combined together make an environment now remember that reproduction is equally important to survival actually the apparent goal of every organism is to fill the available space with its offspring so habitat is a place where you live and reproduce now what is ecology Ecology is a branch of biology which studies interaction between organisms and between organism and surroundings. Now, what is biosphere? The biosphere is made up of the part of earth where life exists. The biosphere extends from the deepest root systems of trees to the dark environment of ocean trenches to the lush rainforest and high mountain tops. Since life exists on the ground, in the air and in the water the biosphere overlaps all these spheres now let us discuss the next term that is carrying capacity the maximum number of organisms of a population that can be sustained by a given habitat for example how many organism can resources support if resources are enough for 5 but there are 8 people if there are 8 people and resources are of for 5 people then we can say that given habitat is overpopulated and it is beyond carrying capacity of that habitat now one of the most important concept ecological niche that is the role of an organism in an ecosystem where it lives let me give you an simple example the society in which you are living is your habitat you are a student so your functional role is you eat you play and you study if you are an policeman you maintain law and order this is how you contribute and make impact now this is for your understanding now let us take more conventional example of dung beetle dung beetles eat dung dung is plentiful in almost all biomes dung beetle eats that dung and make a ball out of it it feeds on it and female lay their eggs on that ball by doing so they provide nutrition to soil so this is a functional role of a dung beetle in environment they eat the dung so their stomach gets filled and they provide nutrition to soil now what is biome a biome is a large community of vegetation and wildlife adapted to a specific climate so it is a community adapted to a specific climate it is a large area characterized by its vegetation soil 
climate and wildlife so each biome has a special characteristic they have specific vegetation specific soil specific climate and wildlife there are five major types of biomes aquatic grassland forest desert and tundra though some of these biomes can be further divided into more specific categories such as fresh water marine water savanna tropical rainforest temperate rainforest taiga and so on now let us move to the next sub topic that is major abiotic factors the first one is temperature have you ever asked your mama why she doesn't put curd in the freezer to get set the most interesting example is from our daily life only in freezer organism will not be able to tolerate less temperature and the result will be less reproduction of organisms and the curd will be imperfect i hope you got the point temperature variation can be so high that temperature ranges from sub zero levels in polar areas and high altitudes to 500 degrees celsius in tropical deserts in summer there are however unique habitats such as thermal springs and deep sea hydrothermal vents where average temperature exceeds 1000 degrees celsius now let us move to the next concept now some of your friends get angry even at very small things but some of them are cool and are very flexible and can tolerate any nuisance of yours there are yours yuri friends similar concept applies here a few organisms can tolerate and thrive in a wide range of temperature they are yuri thermals example includes man goat and cow and a vast majority of them are restricted to narrow range of temperature they are stenothermals example include reptiles crustaceans insects salmons penguins python crocodile etc these are stenothermals now next important abiotic factor is water jal hi jeevan hai the famous slogan of jal jeevan mission of a water ministry used in every template itself signifies the importance of water its availability is so limited in desert that only special adaptations make it possible for organisms to live there the productivity distribution of plants is also heavily dependent on water now for aquatic organisms the quality of water is also important quality means the chemical composition and ph level of the water the salt concentration is also measured as salinity in parts per thousand is also important the salinity which is measured in parts per thousand is less than 5 in inland waters 30 to 35 in the seas and more than 100 in some hypersaline lagoons now some water species sab kuch sahan kar lete hain and they are called urihaline examples of urihalines are oysters clams etc and some water species are very sensitive to salinity of water examples are coral reefs and goldfish now let us move to the next important abiotic factor that is light since plants produce food through photosynthesis a process which is only possible when sunlight is available as a source of energy we can quickly understand the importance of light for living organisms particularly autotrophs autotrophs khud ka khana khud bana lete hain many species of small plants herbs and shrubs growing in forest are adopted to photosynthesis optimally under very low light conditions because they are constantly overshadowed by tall canopied trees many plants are also dependent on sunlight to meet their photoperiodic requirement for flowering but imagine deep in the oceans even in those benthic areas where sunlight is not adequate we find life there waha light kon bhejta hai what then is the source of energy there now some of them feed on dead animal carcasses that sink deep after dying and some feed on chemicals coming out from deep sea vents now the next important factor is soil variation can be found in soils too it is dependent on the climate the weathering process whether soil is transported or sedimentary in nature and how soil development has occurred various characteristic of the soil such as soil composition grain size and aggregation determine the percolation and water holding capacity of the soils these characteristics along with parameters such as ph level mineral composition and topography determine to a large extent what kind of vegetation that soil can support in any given area 
This in turn dictates the type of animal that can be supported. Similarly, in the aquatic environment, the sediment characteristic often determine the type of benthic animals that can thrive on that type of soil. Now we learned about abiotic factors such as water, sunlight and soil. Now let us learn about responses to these abiotic factors by organisms. How do the organisms living in such habitats cope or manage with stressful conditions and variation in these abiotic factors? During the course of millennium of years, species would have evolved a relatively constant internal environment that permits all biochemical reactions and psychological functions to proceed with maximal efficiency and this enhances the overall fitness of the species. Now, what is homeostasis? It is a self-regulating process by which an organism tends to maintain stability while adjusting to conditions that are best for its survival. Now, this definition is important and it will be the basis for the next conversation. Now, depending on the responses to abiotic factors, we find two types of organisms, regulators and conformers. And there are another two types that we will discuss further. The first one is regulate. Organisms maintain homeostasis by ensuring constant body temperature that is thermoregulation and constant osmotic concentration that is osmoregulation. For example, mammals regulate temperature by shivering in cold and sweating in heat. Now let us take a simple example. While going in a congested bus, you regulate according to the seat which is available to you. Agar seat pura ka pura khali hai, to aap fail ke baitte ho or if there are two or three people, you adjust as per the size and availability of space. So you are flexible in this regard. Similarly, humans live both in polar regions as well as in the tropical deserts of Sahara and they are successful in doing so because they can adjust or maintain a constant body temperature. In summer we sweat because our outside temperature is more than body temperature and in winters we start to shiver which produces heat and raises the body temperature. But ye toh humne apna soch liya. What about plants? Have you ever seen them shivering? Is it possible for them to maintain body temperature? Now let us move to the next category that is conformers. 99% of animals and nearly all plants cannot maintain a constant internal environment. And that's why they have not evolved to become regulators. This is a very similar to concept that I cannot afford an air conditioner so I simply conform to surrounding temperature. But we are regulators, our internal AC maintains our temperature. But see, the point I am trying to make is that as AC is expensive, similarly thermoregulation is energetically expensive for many organisms. Small animals like shrews or hummingbirds are conformers because they are relatively too small. The heat they produce is significantly less and not enough to keep them warm enough. As small animals have larger surface area relative to their volume, they tend to lose body heat very fast when it is cold outside. Then they have to expand much energy to generate body heat through metabolism. This is the main reason why very small animals are rarely found in polar regions. Some species have evolved the ability to regulate but only over a limited range of environmental conditions beyond which they simply conform. If they cannot afford even this, they are left with only two alternatives that is to migrate or to suspend. Now migrate. This is to avoid the stressful habitat to a more hospitable area and return when the stressful period is over. Now, you are also class when the boring teacher ka period is over. In human analogy, this strategy is like persons moving from Delhi to Shimla for the duration of summer or Russians moving to Goa during the harsh winters. Many animals, particularly birds, during winter undertake long distance migration to more hospitable areas. Every winter, the famous Kevla Dev National Park of Bharatpur, Rajasthan is a host to thousands of migratory birds coming from Siberia and other extreme cold northern regions. 
The next is suspend. When you cannot migrate, you surrender. The case of bears going into hibernation during the winter is an example of escape in time. They cannot migrate, so they hibernate. They save their energy instead of wasting that energy in search of food. Now there is a very famous story related to Kumbhakaran in Ramayana. Kumbhakaran used to eat a lot and just to save the food, he slept for six months every year. Similar to that, hibernation is a way for many creatures from butterflies to bats to bears to survive the cold dark winters without having to search for food or to migrate somewhere else. Estivation is the similar condition in which other species such as earthworms, frogs, snails, salamanders, crocodiles which are present in warm tropical latitudes, they survive harsh summers by finding a moist and shady place to suspend in order to avoid heat related problems. This is also known as summer sleep. Similar concept is diapause. It is a period of suspended development in an insect, other vertebrate or mammal embryo, especially during unfavorable environmental conditions. Now let us move to the next important concept that is adaptations. You have to adjust when you visit your relative's home or when guests come to your home. You stay silent for some time until you get acclimatized. You adapt to the situation. Same here, adaptation is the biological mechanism by which organisms adjust to new environments or change in environment to ensure survival. There is a mind-blowing example. In the absence of an internal and external source of water, a kangaroo rat in the North American desert is capable of meeting water requirements through its internal fat oxidation and the byproduct of that fat oxidation is water. It also has the ability to concentrate its urine so that minimal volume of water is used to remove excretory products. So this is how the kangaroo rat saves water. Now there are four types of adaptations. Number one. Physiological adaptation. It allows organism to respond quickly to a stressful situation. Have you ever wondered when you go to high altitudes, why you suffer altitude sickness? Its symptoms include nausea, fatigue and heart palpitations. It is because our body doesn't get enough oxygen. So the body compensates low oxygen availability by increasing red blood cell production. So, in turn, this decreases the binding affinity of hemoglobin and increases the breathing rate. There are such native tribes which live in Himalayas. They normally have a higher red blood cell count because they have adapted themselves to that environment. Next is behavioral adaptations. It is change in your normal behavior to cope with the situation. Examples beer hibernating, birds migrating is an example of behavioral adaptation. Also there are biochemical adaptations. Now UV rays are bad for humans. Now this melanin acts as a protective biological shield against ultraviolet radiation. By doing this, it helps to prevent sunburn damage that could result in DNA changes and subsequently several kind of malignant skin cancers. This is an example of biochemical adaptation. These are the changes to the structure, function, regulation and integration of biological molecules and metabolic processes. The final is morphological adaptations. A structural change which gives an organism a greater chance of survival in its habitat. For example, fennec fox lives in the desert. Its structural adaptation is to have large ears. This allows heat to be radiated from the body and helping to cool it down. Similar to that, the tropical elephants have large ears, whereas polar bear has small ears. Now let us move to the second part of the chapter that is populations. In nature, we rarely find isolated single individuals of any species. The majority of them live in the groups in a well-defined geographical area. They share similar resources and interbreed and because of that, they constitute a population. Actually, the apparent goal of every organism is to fill the available space with its offspring. We discussed that earlier. Some examples of population are all the rats in the abundant dwelling, teakwood trees in the forest tract, bacteria in a culture plate, and lotus plants in pond 
and all the humans living in the land of India or any geographical entity. Now population ecology is therefore an important area because it links ecology to population genetics and evolution. Now here we will understand some terms related to populations. Number one, sex ratio. The sex ratio is the ratio of males to females in a population. Now, according to the recently released economic survey, India has more females as compared to males. It stands at 1020 females per 1000 males. Next is age pyramid. In population, everyone is of not the same age. There are some younger ones, some elders and so on. So if age distribution is plotted for a population, the result will be an age pyramid. The shape of the pyramid reflects the growth status of the population, whether it is growing, whether it is stable or whether it is declining. Most of the African countries having growing populations. USA and China ki population budi hoti ja rahi hai. Similar to that, Japan is having declining population pyramid. So let us move to the next concept that is population density. Population density is the concentration of individuals within a species in a specific geographic area. Population density of Bihar is relatively high as compared to Sikkim because more population is concentrated in relatively smaller area. The density of population in a given habitat during a given period fluctuates due to changes in four basic processes that is natality, immigration, mortality and emigration. First two contribute to an increase and last two contribute to decrease. Now what is population growth? Population growth is the increase in the number of people in population over a period of time. Now what is natality? Natality refers to the number of births during a given period of the population that are added to the initial density. For example, number of births per 1000 individuals of population. Now what is mortality? It is the number of deaths in the population during given period of time. For example, number of deaths per 1000 individuals of population. Now what is immigration with I? It is the number of individuals of the same species that have come into the habitat from elsewhere during the time period under consideration. Example, someone comes in our locality for living. The next is emigration. That is, it is the number of individuals of the population who left the habitat and gone somewhere during the time period under consideration. Now population density will increase if the number of birth plus the number of immigrants that is natality and immigration is more than the number of deaths plus the number of immigrants that is mortality and immigration. But in normal circumstances birth and death rates are most influencing factors in the population growth. Now let us discuss the growth models. Population of species when it increases or decreases show their creativity. Now there are two types of growth models. One is exponential growth model and another is logistic growth model. Now exponential growth model is related to the growth of population where resources are not limited. And when resources are unlimited, the population grows exponentially. But this is unrealistic. There is always a resource crunch in environment. After one point, organisms start competing for resources then the fittest individual will survive and reproduce. In case of logistic growth, a population growing in a habitat with limited resources shows initially a lag phase followed by phase of acceleration and then deceleration and finally an asymptot when the population density reaches the carrying capacity. The shape of logistic growth is sigmoid. Now let us discuss the life history variation. Why populations evolve? to maximize their reproductive fitness also called as Darwinian fitness that is why populations evolve. Some organisms breed once in a while, others breed many times. Some produce a large number of small sized offspring while others produce small number of large sized offspring. Now which is desirable? Which is going to maximize fitness? Ecologists suggest that life history traits of organisms have evolved in a relation to the constraints imposed by the abiotic and biotic components of the habitat in which they live. Now let us discuss the last important concept that is population interactions. There is no such habitat on the earth that is inhabited just by a single species. The minimum requirement is one 
more species on which it can feed. Even a plant cannot survive alone, जबकि वो तो खुद का खाना खुद बनाते हैं A plant needs soil microbes to break down the organic matter in soil and return the inorganic nutrients for absorption. And then, how will the plant manage pollination without an animal agent? How it will reproduce? So it is not possible for any species to live in isolation. It is like sabka saath, sabka vikas. Interspecific interactions arise from the interaction of population of two different species. They could be beneficial, detrimental or neutral to each other. Where both species will benefit, jaha dono ka fayda ho, usse kehte hai mutualism. Jaha dono ka nuksan ho, that is called as competition. In both parasitism and predation, only one species is benefited. The interaction where one species is benefited and the other is neither benefited nor harmed is called commensalism. Dusre ko kuch faragi nahi padta. In amensalism, on the other hand, one species is harmed or destroyed, whereas the other species is unaffected. It is like a one-sided love story. Now let us discuss each in detail. Predation. It is beneficial to predators while prey is harmed. Ek ka fayda hota hai, ek ka pura ka pura nuksan. One gets destroyed. The more traditional example is where a lion eats a deer, but a sparrow eating any seed is also a predator. And some plants which eat insects are also predators. Predators don't only transform energy, they play many important roles also. They keep prey population under control. Otherwise, prey species may have achieved a very high population density and have caused instability in the ecosystem. When certain exotic species are introduced into a geographical area, they become invasive and start spreading fast because the invaded land does not have its natural predators. And there is such a relatable example that prickly pear cactus, which was introduced into Australia in the early 1920s, caused havoc by spreading rapidly into millions of hectares of rangeland. Finally, the invasive cactus was brought under control only after cactus feeding predator, a moth from its natural habitat was introduced into the country. Now wait. What if predators are so efficient and because of this prey species got extinct and also predator becomes extinct because of lack of food. The thing is that actual predators in nature are prudent than efficient. They are wise because of if they are efficient they will clear all prey population and eventually run out of food. So predators in the nature are prudent. Some species of insects and frogs are cryptically colored, that is camouflaged, to avoid being detected easily by the predator. Some are poisonous and therefore avoided by predators. The monarch butterfly is highly distasteful to its predator because of a special chemical present in its body. Interestingly, the butterfly acquires this chemical during its caterpillar stage by feeding on a poisonous weed. Now the next interaction is competition. You can say competition occurs when closely related species compete for the same resource that are limiting. But this is not set in stone. Firstly, totally unrelated species could also compete for the same resource. For instance, in some shallow South American lakes, visiting flamingos and resident fishes compete for the common food that is the zooplankton in the lake. Secondly, resources need not be limiting for competition to occur. In interference competition, the feeding efficiency of one species might be reduced due to the interfering and inhibitory presence of other species, even if resources are abundant. Competition is best defined as process in which the fitness of one species is significantly lower in the presence of another species. The abundant tortoise in Galapagos Island become extinct within a decade after goats were introduced on the island, apparently due to the greater browsing efficiency of the goats. A species whose distribution is restricted to small geographical area because of the presence of competitively superior species is found to expand its distributional range dramatically when the competing species is experimentally remote. देखो बड़ा भाई बाहर चला जाता है तो छोटा भाई दादागिरी तो करता है ना नाउ नेक्स्ट कॉन्सेप्ट 
Gauche's competitive exclusion principle. It states that two closely related species competing for the same resource cannot coexist indefinitely and the competitively inferior one will be eliminated eventually. One such mechanism is resource partition. Adha tera, adha mera. If two species compete for the same resource, they could avoid competition by choosing, for instance, different times for feeding or different foraging partners. MacArthur showed that five closely related species of wobblers, a bird, living on the same tree were able to avoid competition and coexist due to their behavioral difference in their foraging that is searching of food activities. The next interaction is parasitism. Have you ever listened to the famous dialogue Jiski thali mein khata hai, usi thali mein wo chhed karta hai. This is perfect definition of parasitism. One organism, the parasite, lives on or inside another organism that is lives inside the host or on it and causing it harm. The parasite is adapted structurally to this way of life. Many parasites have evolved to be host specific. They can parasites only a single species of host in such a way that both host and the parasite tend to co-evolve. That is, if the host evolve special mechanism for rejecting or resisting the parasite, the parasite has to evolve mechanism to counteract and naturalize them in order to be successful with the same host species. Examples are helminthus, that is worms in the intestine of the host and they suck nutrients, lice in the human head, plasmodium species transmitted by anophelian mosquito and causing malaria in humans. Majority of the parasite harm the host. They may reduce the survival, growth and reproduction of the host and reduce its population density. They might render the host more vulnerable to predation by making it physically weak. Parasites that feed on the external surface of the host organism are called ectoparasites. The most familiar examples of this group are the lice or lice on humans and ticks on dogs. Now there are also endoparasites that live inside the host. Endoparasites are those parasites that live inside the host body at different sites like liver, kidney, lungs, red blood cells, etc. The life cycle of endoparasites are more complex because of their extreme specialization. Now let us move to the another interaction that is commensalism. This is the interaction in which one species benefits and the other is neither harmed nor benefited. Ek ka fayda aur dusre ka matlab bhi nahi. For example, an orchid growing as an epiphyte on a mango branch and barnacles growing on the back of a well benefit while neither the mango tree nor the well derives any apparent benefit from this interaction. Another example of commensalism is the interaction between sea anemone that has the stinging tentacles and the clownfish that lives among them. The fish gets protection from the predators which stay away from the stinging tentacles. The anemone does not appear to derive any benefit by hosting the clownfish. Now let us move to the another interaction that is mutualism. This interaction confers benefits on the both interacting species. This is the best deal jaha pe dono ko fayda hota hai. For example, lichens represent an intimate mutualistic relationship between the fungus and photosynthesizing algae or a cyanobacteria. Here the fungi provide a moist sheltered habitat for the cyanobacteria or algae and in turn algae provide food for the fungi. Similarly, plants need the help of animals for pollinating their flowers and dispersing their seeds. Animals obviously have to be paid fees for the services that plant expect from them. Plants offer rewards or fees in the form of pollen and nectar for pollinators and juicy and nutritious fruits for seed dispersers. But the sad truth is cheaters are present everywhere. For example, animals that try to steal nectar without aiding in pollination. Now this is all from this chapter. Now let us discuss some things that are uh, left to be discussed like sexual deceit. Sexual deceit is an example of mutualism in which the flower behaves like the female insect to attract the male insect for pollination. Example is orchid flowers are modified in such a way that 
one petal of the flower resembles the female insect now what is cam that is crassulation acid metabolism it is also known as cam photosynthesis it is a carbon fixation pathway that evolved in some plants as adaptation to arid conditions that allows a plant to photosynthesize during the day but exchange of gases took place at night it mostly evolves in arid conditions now what are phenotypic adaptation phenotypic adaptation involves changes in the body of an organism in response to genetic mutation or certain environmental changes these responsive adjustment occur in an organism in order to cope with environmental conditions present in their natural habitats so finally you can take a breath of relief because it is completed if you have any doubts please comment in the comment section below i would be more than happy to solve your doubts if you want to have these notes in pdf format please visit our website it can help us to grow and create more meaningful content thank you i hope this helps